Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for today's webinar. The topic for today's discussion is U.S. tax reform and India Union budget and the impact on U.S.-India trade. As the U.S. is one of India's major trading partners, we believe the overhaul of the U.S. tax system will have a significant impact on India-U.S. trade. The U.S. reform measures include a deemed profits repatriation tax on U.S. profits of U.S. enterprises retained overseas, significant reductions in U.S. corporate tax rates, migration in part to a territorial tax system, the introduction of base erosion and anti-abuse tax, also known as BEAT, and global intangible low tax income, also known as GILTI. Our speakers for today are Brian Mitchell and Malik Doshi. Brian has more than 19 years of combined professional experience in public accounting and as a tax executive within a large global private equity firm. He has a deep understanding of tax matters impacting high growth professional services and technology companies and those with valuable intellectual property, especially those operating in jurisdictions outside of the US. He has significant experience in tax planning, compliance, and risk management for US taxation and cross-border transactions. Malik heads the transfer pricing uh, at SKP Group and has over 14 years of experience in cross-border tax and transfer pricing. Malik advises multinational corporations on Indian and global transfer pricing rules in all contexts, including planning, litigation, APAs, and contemporaneous document documentation studies. His extensive transfer pricing experience includes transfers of tangible and intangible property, intercompany services, cost sharing arrangement, intercompany loans, and guarantees. Welcome to all of our listeners across a number of jurisdictions. Please note that our listeners are in listen-only mode. If you have any questions, please share them with us through the chat box at the right-hand side of your screen, and we'll address your questions at the end of the webinar. Without any further, further delay, we'll start the webinar. Brian? Thank you. Appreciate everyone joining, uh, and welcome everyone from uh, various jurisdictions that have dialed in. We have a, uh, a very comprehensive agenda today, and we're pretty excited to talk about the change in tax law regarding uh, both on the U.S. side and Indian side and how that may affect uh, both opportunities as well as risk for uh, cross-border trade between the U.S. and India. We have a fairly comprehensive agenda that we're going to get through. It's really uh, uh, set out in three parts. One, we're going to talk about the outbound changes, U.S. outbound into India, um, as well as U.S. inbound changes from India, as well as incorporate structures uh, between both of those. And then towards the end of the presentation, we'll be talking about uh, different Indian changes. This is really only a portion of uh, the U.S. changes overall, but what we believe are some of the more significant ones, particularly those affecting cross-border trade between the two countries. Um, um, and as, as Sarah mentioned, we would like to encourage participation, and certainly uh, as part of this, we'll you know, look forward to learning from you in terms of things that, that you're struggling with. The next slide represents a comparison of the various global tax rates across different jurisdictions. Of course, one thing that we see was uh, before these changes in the U.S., a relatively high rate of tax on corporate income uh, approximating uh, 39%. That, of course, was at the upper band. With these changes, the the United States now sits at the the lower middle part of the pack in terms of overall headline rate. And I think as we'll learn going through these slides, there's a fair chance, depending on your particular tax situation, that that 21% rate can drop even more. And we'll talk about some of those as we go through the slides. So now in terms of the outbound slides, and really before we get into uh, the, the deeper part of the, the conversation, we really wanna make three points. And really just three several you know important observations about what these uh, uh, changes imply and the first of those is that there is a real need regardless of your particular situation to the extent that you have operations in the u.s and cross-border trade with the with the u.s you really need to revisit your global tax structure and the relationships between the u.s entities and other operations worldwide 
And I think as we go through, we're finding that uh, almost all taxpayers in light of the significant changes really need to take a re complete reassessment of where they're at relative to these, these significant changes. The second observation to be made is that the impact of these changes will be felt differently uh, from taxpayer to taxpayer and sometimes even within the same industry. And I think in the past, uh, we've gotten used to uh, tax law applying in ways that uh, quite frankly was, was uh, what was applied similarly. And I think with these new tax laws, there's a risk of overgeneralization. And with these new changes, what you really need to be doing is thinking about how these changes are directly impacting your transaction flow. And then finally, as, as you think about what we're seeing today, uh, keep in mind that the impact will have both surprising impacts in many ways, and, and in other ways, both unpredictable and unknown effects. We're only uh, short of three months into the tax law changes. And I think as those of us, both on the practitioner side, as well as clients incorporate what is unfolded, I think there will be much, much more to come in terms of how that may apply to different situations, as well as additional detailed guidance that's forthcoming from the IRS that certainly practitioners as well as clients are anxiously awaiting for. So the details of this are, are really uh, a yet to unfold. So in terms of the reforms affecting outbound investments, we've selected really four uh, sort of, uh, some of these are new concepts and, and really uh, meant to uh, transition US outbound taxpayers to a new system of tax that is very, very different than the one we had before. In many ways, the old rules continue to apply, particularly in the area of subpart F with, with some modifications. But really what you should view these changes are as an adoption and a migration to a complete new system of US taxation for transactions uh, outside the US. And, and, and those are, as you see here, and we'll go through each one of those. The first one is really the one that has uh, gotten a lot of our more immediate attention, uh, probably the one that you've read and have dealt with the, the most potentially in your business, is this, this idea of a transition tax on earnings and profits that have been held through foreign corporations that through uh, prior rules have been allowed to not yet have been taxed in the US. So we have this mandatory deemed repatriation concept that applies where US multinational companies, as well as, uh, uh, by the way, partnerships and US individuals will be required to compute their untaxed earnings in foreign subsidiaries and include uh, a, a, a portion of those earnings on their US tax return. And, and one of the things to point out here with the transition tax is that unlike the vast majority of changes that have a, a prospective tax effect in 2018 and beyond, this particular provision has immediate impact on the 2017 returns. And I can speak for our firm as well as firms that, that, uh, that we're connected to and, and those who are uh, dealing with this. It certainly got a lot of attention. It's uh, had a lot of time and I think there is a risk of under, uh, of assuming that the amount of time spent to actually compute this with some degree of, of uh, uh, precision is actually more complicated than, than meets the eye. But at any rate, if, if you are a, what we call a controlled foreign corporation, and you're a US shareholder of that controlled foreign corporation, as well as a US shareholder, meaning a 10% owner of a foreign corp in other situations, you may be affected by this. So certainly, uh, working through this uh, would be uh, uh, recommended. So the details of the change we'll, we'll get through. I, I, in effect, you're taking untaxed earnings, or at least untaxed in the U.S. sense, computing those and uh, paying one of two different rates. There's a 15.5% tax rate 
on earnings or, to, or that have not yet been taxed in the U.S. that tracks to really balance sheet items of the foreign corp in the term of cash and cash equivalents. And then there's a residual, uh, perhaps uh, obviously more favorable rate for all other income that's held in something other than cash or cash equivalents at an 8% rate. Those amounts, as is the earnings, is are really determined on the last day of, of, of the tax year following November 2nd. Uh, in some cases, you have fiscal year shareholders that, that have a deferral aspect and uh, will be computing that thereafter. But, but certainly something to pay attention to in terms of overall uh, immediate impact and potentially the high risk of paying residual U.S. income tax and in effect could very well have a permanent effect just by the way it's designed. The, the design of this also allows the tax to actually be paid over an eight-year period, the first of which is about 8% of that liability would be due uh, for most taxpayers, April 17th of 2018. So very, very quickly, we've got shareholders in the U.S. Uh, that are that has got untaxed income that, that is going to be of significance. One thing to point out for those in the audience that it affects, if you are a what's called a U.S. S corporation, uh, this particular provision will have special significance both at the S corp level as well, well as the S corp shareholder that that needs uh, uh, quite a bit of attention and um, to the you know to the extent that you want to read additional guidance some of the very first guidance that's been issued by the IRS has been in this area and it's reflected on the slide deck which will be uh, delivered to you in in the context of uh, participating in this call. So moving on from that, we have uh, an example of how this transition tax works, and we have effectively an Indian and German subsidiary. Uh, in the case of the Indian subsidiary, it has a thousand dollars of earnings. Presumably, those earnings have not yet been taxed in the U.S., and then you have a German subsidiary that has a deficit in its earnings. The mechanics of this uh, is fairly detailed, but in effect, the deficit on the German side is at least capable of offsetting the $1,000 of untaxed earnings, so you really have, uh, in most cases, a net effect or a net taxable inclusion, and by mechanic, the, the design of this is that 800 would be included as a gross item of income and there would be a corresponding dividends received deduction that really tracks to one of the two rates that I mentioned. Again, the 15.5% or 8% rate. In this example, you're really seeing the effect of the $800 of earnings uh, in uh, all non-cash items and taxed at the 8% rate and really a, a fairly high level example of what is in essence a residual US tax that will be due and uh, need to be calculated on the US return in regards to the, the transition tax. And as you think through this, this is a deemed income, it's income that doesn't necessarily track to whether or not those earnings have been repatriated in the form of an actual dividend. And one of the questions that's really outstanding in terms of uh, something to monitor and, and is really uh, folds into a planning item is what happens if the actual distribution is made after uh, the date in which the transition tax occurred and what happens to actual withholding taxes, for example, in the case of, of India and any other jurisdiction that has outbound withholding on, on dividend distributions uh, uh, above zero, something that, that you should monitor. The next example, uh, by comparison, and is something our firm is certainly dealing with, is what happens if you're a U.S. partnership? Uh, the, 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 the U.S. individual partners then are directly affected by this taxable income inclusion, and there is effectively a communication requirement, uh, both actually as well as through uh, what we call the K-1s uh, 
and the K-1 footnotes to make sure that the U.S. individuals have information about what's going on, the magnitude of the uh, taxable income inclusion, and in some cases, uh, making important decisions by way of, of, of elections to be taxed in a way differently on this income that may actually allow for the use of foreign tax credits that in absence of that election may not be possible. So it's really, really important uh, that uh, those who are affected that may have unrepatriated taxable income earned through foreign subsidiaries uh, really be attuned to the, the fact that we've got uh, uh, some significance to that. In addition to the uh, transition tax, we also have a exemption system that's very, very new to the US that effectively exempts future earnings, those earnings uh, for distributions made after December 31st, 2017, which will provide a 100% dividends received deduction for earnings derived through a foreign corporation by a U.S. domestic corporation. This is a significant change. That means earnings derived through those situations are completely shielded from uh, the 21% tax that is otherwise now due. And as we'll see on the next slide, um, there is a, a additional corresponding uh, uh, overriding uh, 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 calculation that needs to be made that may actually change that answer. So whereas you get, uh, it is true that you get a 100% dividends received deduction, I would, caution you that that's not in all cases. Effectively, with the combined provisions of the U.S. dividends received deduction, along with this concept, new concept called guilty, which is global intangible low taxed income, you could find yourself with taxable income through guilty uh, that is very different than the income that would otherwise be exempt. So guilty applies, and to the extent that you have it, uh, in uh, by by way of calculation, you would have to include that income uh, in the U.S. T uh, corporate tax return. And in effect, the mechanic is that you're allowed to uh, the exemption, but only in as much as uh, the earnings of the foreign sub tracks to this concept that you have 10% a uh, routine ret rate of return on what they call qualified business asset investments, effectively uh, property, plant, and equipment, or assets that are other gi otherwise gives rise to uh, depreciation deductions. So in effect, each CFC would need to compute its aggregate amount of uh, depreciable fixed assets, would then apply a 10% routine rate of return and that amount is at least capable of receiving complete 100% dividends received deduction, but yet you have the incremental income over and above that 10% rate of return, which would be taxed at the U.S. corporate level, both immediately as well as at a, at a slightly different rate. There is, along with and by the way, included within these slides are some detailed details regarding what is qualified business assets uh, and, and the like. But in, in effect, the mechanic is, is that while you have to include the excess of routine rate of return over, over and above the 10% rate of return as a current income inclusion, by way of uh, procedure, they give you a 50% deduction of that same amount. So in effect, rather than paying 21% U.S. tax on dividends, you're in effect paying an equivalent of 10.5% rate. And of course, they allow you to offset the guilty inclusion and the U.S. tax on the guilty inclusion by a pro rata share of foreign tax credits uh, derived through the foreign court. But only up to 80%. So in effect, what you have with guilty 
is the possibility to completely shield U.S. tax so long as your effective foreign tax rate is, is approximately 13 percent or more. And, and certainly in the case of Indian subsidiaries, there, um, the, though the effective tax rate on, on those subs in most cases, I think, would, would be well above that 13% that threshold. We have an example here. I won't go through all the details. You, you can do that uh, as we provide the, the slide deck. But some of the things to point out, for example, using the example where you've got $1,000 of earnings in, in the Indian sub, and where that Indian sub has, in this case, $5,000 of, of uh, uh, net tax basis in its depreciable assets, the first 10% of that, or rather $500, is the routine rate of return. That's free of U.S. tax under the dividends, dividends received deduction. The excess, and in this, this example, the excess rate of return, which is $150 in this example, would then be included as a guilty inclusion, and, and you have the example on, at least in this case, what uh, a sample U.S. tax calculation would be on, on the guilty amount. Uh, this, this next example shows what would happen if the, uh, uh, the foreign rate or the non-U.S. rate within the uh, non-US company is zero and in effect you have, as I mentioned, a, a minimum tax or global minimum tax in the US tracking to a 10.5% rate. And then finally on the US outbound discussion, we have an entirely new concept under US law call, called uh, foreign derived intangible income or I think as most practitioners are calling it, FITI. <laughs> Uh, the the mechanic under the the FITI rules are basically allowing where you have a U.S. corporation that otherwise has qualifying uh, export sales and in some case services to have a deduction that in effect for the net margin on those sales uh, in lieu of a 21 percent rate would have an effective tax rate as low as 13 percent. So certainly, uh, if you combine that with everything that we've just said thus far, the uh, dividends received deduction, the, the mechanics of a lower rate on guilty, alongside the possibility that you could use a U.S. company to have non-U.S. sales certainly makes uh, an attractive case for using a U.S. company as a holding jurisdiction potentially for the rest of the world in, in certain scenarios. And uh, it may not apply in all scenarios, but certainly uh, it gives a, uh, a, a, a new chance and something to certainly look at in terms of how you might use U.S. companies going forward. Um, a couple of things to point out, and I mentioned it apply, you know, el those that are or the margin eligible for transactions include uh, property, whether it's leased, licensed, or, or sold. Uh, to non-U.S. persons for the consumption outside the U.S., uh, for example, software licenses to non-U.S. customers, so long as the jurisdiction of the customers outside the U.S. certainly uh, should be qualifying income, as well as services that are that are rendered with respect to property outside the U.S. There, there's a handful of detailed rules on this. We would encourage you to use um, uh, uh, your U.S. practitioner, hopefully. If, if it's not us, someone who's followed this fairly closely to figure out whether this is something that might be attractive in your case. Um, and again, we've included detailed slides on some of the key concepts that you can review. And, and really to finish out and round out the conversation on U.S. outbound is, uh, and we wanted to present really what this might look like in, in a relatively simple case, between what we believe are two viable choices uh, of U.S. operations making investments in India. On the left-hand side, you have the, the traditional company, Indian uh, private company route. And on the right-hand side, uh, you have the concept of using a limited liability partnership. And maybe at this point, I'd like to get Malik to comment 
on the comparison between these two uh, choices and the significance of that from an Indian tax perspective. Right, right. Uh, so essentially we have uh, in this setup uh, uh, a concept of a limited liability partnership in India, which is uh, kind of recently opened up for foreign investments and uh, the traditional setup in terms of the private limited company. And uh, when one looks at both the options, uh, while by and large the, the, the thought process till now was to open a private limited company in India, uh, like, like we saw in the earlier slides, uh, there, are, there will be a significant tax cost in India because the private limited company gets taxed at, at a corporate tax rate of around 34 percent and to top it up uh, whenever the private limited company would declare dividends to its parent company back in USA there will be a 20 percent odd dividend distribution tax. On the other end the limited liability partnership offers advantage not only in terms of ease and simplicity of doing businesses but there is no dividend distribution tax when the limited liability partnership declares and repatriates the profits on in India back to the U.S. Uh, parent company or U.S. partners. So, uh, from a from a tax perspective, definitely the limited liability partnership is uh, much more advantageous. And if if you look at it from from a, from a U.S. perspective, also uh, the 20 percent dividend distribution tax paid under the private limited company uh, it essentially becoming a tax cost because uh, uh, based on what Brian mentioned. Uh, this would be a foreign sourced uh, dividends and foreign sourced income for the U.S. company and under the, under the revised tax uh, plan, uh, this income would not get taxed in USA. So whatever taxes are being paid in India in terms of the, the dividend distribution tax, they become a tax cost for the group. Uh, whereas in case of a limited liability partnership, uh, again the foreign income would not be taxed. So in U.S. we would not for suffer any taxation. And in India, like I mentioned, there is no dividend distribution tax for a limited liability partnership. So there is no tax impact on repatriation of profits from India. So for, for simply putting it, the LLP option seems to be much more uh, kind of a tax efficient way of doing it. But obviously there are uh, considerations that one needs to look at uh, while choosing either of the options. Uh, by and large, an LLP option is preferable in case where uh, whether it's the Indian company is providing services back to its parents. So if it's a captive service provider providing either back office IT enabled services, BPO, marketing services, those kind of scenarios does make sense uh, to go for an LLP. And in case uh, if, if the Indian company is into uh, government contracts, tendering for contracts with large private companies and government companies, infrastructure sector or manufacturing sector, an LLP, while it's legally possible uh, is not the route to be adopted because uh, a number of places there will be restrictions on LLP to participate in such tender activities or in such contracts and uh, also from a from a borrowing perspective if the if the Indian operations requires local borrowing from Indian banks over here bankers would prefer to kind of give money to a private limited company rather than lend to a LLP so from that perspective considering the commercial and the business aspects as well as the tax aspects one is to see which of the which are the either of the options works out best for them. Right. Yeah. Thank. Thank you, Malik. And and certainly the LLP in light of the U.S. changes cer certainly looks attractive uh, uh, to the extent that it makes sense. And so so thanks for sharing that. The um, and maybe to finish out, you know, our our combined firm's views on how to think about. Uh, U.S. outbound into India situations uh, and, and things you, you, you might take away from this. What, one is the uh, idea that uh, you really need to take a fresh look at your global structure. And so combined with the dividend exemption system, again, with the other uh, attractive rates for using U.S. holding companies, either at the 10.5% or 13% rate, uh, certainly it, Uh, to, to consider alongside uh, key transfer pricing concepts and what your go forward um, uh, tax structure and supply chain might look like from where assets, people, and, and intangibles in large cases, you know, would be uh, situated. And in addition to that, uh, we talked about the dividend distribution tax, but the, the idea that uh, 
you know, using the LLP structure for those that make sense. Um, it it, um, it it certainly looks looks good. And it, and again, just in terms of uh, transfer pricing policies in general, it's certainly a good time to reconsider uh, what the role of the Indian enterprise ought to be or should be going forward relative to operations that, that are occurring outside of India and in particular with, with the U.S. changes, you know, within the U.S. So now shifting focus to uh, what we call U.S. inbound, or in this case, it would be Indian outbound into the U.S., um, um, walk through some of the key changes that that are unfolding and certainly one of the, one of the biggest changes really is that just the drop in the headline rate from 35 percent to 21 is in and of itself uh, fairly significant alongside the fact that corporate AMT is eliminated with 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 the potential that existing AMT credits uh, come back to you in the form of cash uh, over time, you know, but before 2021. So for those in AMT position, certainly something to monitor in terms of your overall uh, cash tax position. Alongside the significant drop in U.S. rates is the idea that there has, uh, uh, with this new law, the likelihood of accelerating uh, CapEx expense and the com in many cases the complete uh, uh, deduction for assets placed in service in, in key dates. I think the thing to walk away here, as is baked in the larger part of, of the law, some of the most com complexity is around the effective dates of various law laws that apply here. So uh, a sort of caution to those who are thinking about the planning aspects of this, the uh, v various uh, key dates, both in the uh, asset provision and everywhere else certainly needs uh, s some attention. In addition to that, we have some things that have now gone away. Uh, for those that are affected, the DPAT or the Domestic Production Activity de Deduction is no longer in existence, uh, and as well as certain significant changes on those who have been financed either through third parties or through uh, shareholder level debt really need to reassess their uh, situation regarding the de deductibility of interest. The, the new ro rules in the U.S. have a upper limit that's equivalent to 30% of uh, free cash flow or EBITDA up through 2021 and then EBIT thereafter. So, so for those who uh, have the, uh, the possibility of having debt that either is uh, shielding income that's taxed at a much lower rate uh, that, that would be included in income at a, high, a rate higher than 21, it's certainly time to reassess your uh, capital uh, structure in that regard. And then finally, uh, the what has gotten a lot of attention actually is the, the ways in which the U.S. has protected its tax base in the form of uh, what's now called the BEAT or the base erosion anti-abuse tax. This is actually more from what, what was uh, conveyed originally. I think it was conveyed as a 20% uh, penalty tax in certain transactions is now morphed into uh, where you have base erosion payments of at least 3% of your gross tax. There's in effect a mandatory 10% beat tax that acts in many ways much like the corporate AMT did. Uh, the, the one thing here, and I am recognizing we have an audience with a wide array of participants, uh, the, the, the beat applies where you've got annual gross receipts of 500 million. So certainly that threshold is significant for those operating in, in the broader middle market and in many cases uh, may not apply. The other point to be made on the beat for those that it does apply is that it specifically excludes cost of goods sold from uh, being subject to the beat. And so for those who have incorporated pricing that that uh, is exclusive of royalties that are paid uh, and to the extent that the beat ap applies, certainly time to reconsider your pricing, uh, intercompany pricing strategy in regards to uh, royalties that may very well need to be embedded in the price. 
And then moving on, we have significant changes to the way net operating losses can be utilized in the U.S. Uh, the old rules were uh, you could take them back two years or forward 20. Uh, those rules still apply for grandfathered NOLs, but going forward, NOLs generated uh, subsequently are now limited actually to 80%. So in a way, that 80% limit, and despite the AMT uh, actually nominally being taken out, in effect acts in some ways much like the, the old AMT uh, does. And, and so for those who are modeling utilization of NOL, certainly be attuned to the, the fact that they weren't very well could be limited. Uh, and then the ability for certain uh, uh, taxpayers that's in the lower part of the middle market with gross receipts less than 25 million uh, certainly have the ability to utilize the cash met method of accounting. And then for those of you on the call with uh, heavy R&D expenses and those who are used to uh, writing those off under 174, these rules have changed. And going forward, the rules require, in many cases, capitalization of those same costs with, a, with an amortization period over five years. So certainly a, a, a deferral aspect uh, of, of, of those who have R&D costs that may need to be spread out over a number of years. And then for those conducting R&D actually outside the U.S., that amortization period is, is much longer at, at a 15 years. Some of the key considerations as we think about the impact of these rules from a U.S. inbound perspective is the idea that uh, if you're an Indian multinational, you may really want to consider uh, the significance of the functionality of your U.S. operation uh, and maybe a migration from a low-risk distributor model, uh, low-risk distributor model to a more expansive full risk model um, alongside the mechanics of uh, your agency relationships and how uh, extensive the role of the U.S. operator is relative to the, to the rest of the world. And then for the manufacturers in the audience, certainly uh, those who uh, had, had used tolling uh, may want to reconsider uh, using the U.S. to ramp up in a fully fledged way, at least from a transfer pricing perspective. In addition to that, um, the interest expense limitations that we've mentioned uh, are a significant development. It's going to impact taxpayers differently depending on the magnitude of debt in the business and other factors. But certainly one of the things that our firms have been assisting clients with is in terms of reconsidering debt pushdown strategies and the, the proper location of debt alongside other uh, uh, BEPs, uh, uh, significant changes that have unfolded over a number of years, which are certainly out beyond the scope of this, of this uh, presentation. And then really Indian multinationals may, may want to reconsider your the, the manner in which your holding company or the intermediate holding company might work. And, and certainly there's a strong case for using a US company uh, uh, for that role uh, alongside, uh, you know, the lower rates that are attracted to uh, uh, U.S. operations in general in, in some cases. Uh, we've also included three sort of other ideas. Uh, one of the things that uh, we're especially attuned to on the U.S. from a U.S. practitioner side is we have many U.S. clients with fiscal year filing matters that have attributes and situations that can be impacted differently. And, and certainly one of those is the transition tax itself, but there's other attributes that need to be monitored in the context of, of those who are impacted by fiscal year filing. And maybe to move on to a sort of a representative example of some of the historical considerations, not all of them, of course, but some of the considerations that you think of in terms of adopting a holding company strategy. Uh, and we've listed certainly the, the, the VAT sort of is, is increasingly important a part of the supply chain to get right, depending on what your business model is. But really thinking about 
uh, how your business operates both at the initial investment stage, uh, perhaps you're expanding your operations, as well as during that operational stage. And for those who are either private equity in the audience or those who are uh, contemplating an exit, really giving some thought as to what that exit looks like. And there's a strong case that with all of these considerations listed here, that a U.S. holding company may very well be something to seriously consider relative to some of your other choices. What we have here is, is a very, uh, very uh, generalized example of what that might look like. Uh, we've got uh, a U.S. company that has in some fashion licensed its property to, in this case, a German operating company with the idea that those license payments attract a much lower rate of tax than 21%. Uh, so the blended U.S. tax rate on that income is less than the headline rate of 21%. And so for Indian multinational companies, the idea that so long as you don't need the profits back uh, in India and you don't need them repatriated, the U.S. is certainly now one of the attractive jurisdictions, if not a very attractive jurisdiction, to hold your non-Indian non operations, uh, be able to defer that Indian tax in a way that, that possibly uh, moves south of, of 20%. And then what we've included uh, is a very, very specific example on a very, very specific provision of U.S. tax law regarding export incentives. Uh, uh, the, this has been a feature of U.S. statutory law since the 1970s. Uh, and in some cases, many, you know, many U.S. taxpayers have, have used this strategy. And we would suggest just despite the drop in the 35% rate down to 21, uh, the, the DISC continues to be a viable opportunity for, for uh, US inbound companies where the parent is resident in a jurisdiction that has a treaty and where the earnings that are, that are otherwise within the DISC that are themselves tax exempt in the US could very well give rise to a permanent rate difference uh, by operation of uh, the combination of U.S. statutory law and the mechanics of treaties. We would caution you that uh, certainly uh, probably not something to do on your own. It requires heavy thought into, into, into how, how this works, particularly in the context of treaties. But it's a very, very specific idea that in combination with everything we've talked about thus far, I think makes a very compelling case for U.S. holding companies uh, uh, relative to where we were before this new tax law came in, in, in into play. And certainly our firm, as well as Malik's firm, can, can assist you to think about that. And for uh, those that need to reassess their global operations, I think uh, now is certainly uh, as good a time as any uh, to do that in the midst of these uh, fairly broad changes. And with that, Malik, I think you were going to talk about some uh, Indian specific changes in light of uh, what's happening in India and in addition to uh, all the U.S. changes. Malik? Sorry. Uh... So before I go into the India changes, uh, uh, like Brian mentioned, the U.S. tax uh, changes presents a, a wonderful opportunity for uh, companies uh, having India U.S. businesses to relook at the structures, to relook at their operations, and see whether it makes sense for them to kind of uh, uh, move to a, a different structure. Uh, like uh, one different point of consideration is with the reduction in U.S. corporate tax rates. Uh, companies would want to keep more profits uh, uh, in the United States rather than bringing back in India and kind of pay the full corporate tax here in India. So definitely transfer pricing would assume a lot more importance where companies would reassess their functional analysis and see how more profits can be kept at the U.S. level rather than bringing it down back to India. So essentially, uh, I think it's, it's, it's a good time to kind of uh, start looking at uh, uh, how the changes both in US as well as in India, the ones which I'm going to discuss in, in the next slide, how are they going to affect it and what, what companies need to kind of do 
to uh, mitigate if there are any risk or look at any opportunities that are arising from this. In terms of the Indian changes, uh, uh, the the uh, the U.S. Tariff, tariff corporate changes were kind of uh, happening around the around the, the month of December, and uh, India uh, was supposed to present our budget on first of, uh, of uh, February 2018. And uh, once the U.S. tax changes got announced, uh, there was a reaction worldwide, including in India, where even the Indian finance minister set up a small committee to consider the impact of US tax changes on the Indian economy and whether uh, are there any specific steps that Indian company, Indian government needs to take uh, to kind of uh, balance out the US tax changes. And one that was there always on the card was reduction in the corporate tax rate. Uh, the first slide that Brian showed, India was top of the list in terms of the corporate tax rate. And therefore, uh, there was, it was always expected that the finance minister would kind of bring down the rate. Uh, he, he did that, but he did it in a partial manner. So uh, for uh, small and mid-sized companies with turnover up to, uh, to, to 2,500 Indian uh, rupees, uh, 2,500 million Indian rupees, uh, the corporate tax rates have been reduced to 25%. Uh, for other companies, the tax rate the, uh, continues to be at 30%. Uh, while uh, the, the limit uh, is there for small and mid-sized companies, as per the statistics, it covers almost 90% of the corporates in India. Only the 10% of the very large corporates uh, kind of are outside this limit and uh, they will continue to pay the 30% tax. Uh, in order to balance out the, the reduction in corporate tax, uh, the, the government introduced what is called as the long-term capital gains on listed equities. So uh, till now, uh, if, uh, if an investor, be it an Indian or a foreign investor, uh, makes investments in listed equities and on some capital gains out of those uh, listed equities, they were tax exempt completely. With effect from 1st April 2018, uh, a 10% tax would be levied on a long term capital gains. And uh, the, the government defines long term as a, a, a holding period of more than 12 months. Obviously, while bringing this uh, new tax, uh, the government has kept into consideration that. Uh, uh, the earlier regime provided for complete tax exemption and therefore uh, uh, the past gains that were there up to the date of announcement of the budget were grandfathered and protected. So any gains earned up to 31st January 2018 would not be taxed and only gains which are kind of accruing from 1st February 2018 uh, would be taxed. Uh, the last two years saw India kind of adopting a number of changes in, in line with the base erosion profit shifting plans of the OECD, uh, the country by country report and the master file in terms of TP documentation, the interest limitation deduction in terms of action plan four, all those changes were brought in by, uh, by, by India in the last two years. This year, uh, again, India kind of moved in that direction and brought in some more changes based on the action plan. Uh, it, it brought in a concept of a digital permanent establishment, uh, basically to try and tax digital economies, which uh, uh, do businesses in India, though they don't have any physical presence and therefore they escape the tax net. So what the, the, the government now proposes to kind of expand the definition of permanent establishment to include uh, what is called as a significant economic nexus and uh, companies which do not have any physical presence but do have some significant economic nexus uh, would have to pay taxes in India. So while the operational rules are yet to be kind of uh, notified and yet to be issued, uh, this would not kind of have an immediate impact because the changes are under the Indian domestic law, whereas uh, the tax treaty is, remains the same. The tax treaty remains the same with the old permanent establishment definition. And therefore, we would not see any significant changes, uh, especially with tra tra countries where we have tax treaties. Uh, similarly, the concept of a dependent agent permanent establishment, especially for uh, in, uh, Indian subsidiaries of foreign multinationals that are doing marketing, uh, sales activity, uh, the, the role of uh, the, the definition of permanent establishment has been widened to include a case where the Indian company is also playing a principal role in concluding contracts. Earlier, the term was only if the Indian company was negotiating a contract or concluding a contract, but now they have kind of expanded that to include even a principal role in concluding contracts. Again, uh, I don't see any immediate impact of this, especially under India, US, because the, the tax treaty remains unchanged. And the government, while it has kind of uh, uh, made the changes in the law, it has signaled that uh, 
they will go in for treaty renegotiations. They will ensure that the India's tax treaty would con uh, would contain the revised definition, which is as per the domestic law. So the changes do not have any immediate impact, but that's the this direction that the government is kind of thinking through, and that's the direction where the government wants to go about. So broadly. Uh, this was the last uh, budget by the current government and therefore they did not kind of tinker too much in terms of the taxes. Uh, they kind of broadly made some changes which were imminent and which were required. Uh, but otherwise, uh, they kind of uh, uh, followed an approach of keeping the, the, the tax uh, environment more stable. And uh, uh, they kind of brought in some of the changes which were immediate, which were required and which were long outstanding demand from the taxpayers. Essentially, uh, with these Indian changes and the US changes that are taking place, uh, I think it's uh, it's uh, time to kind of uh, understand how these changes are impacting businesses, how these changes are impacting the cross-border trade, and uh, assess whether the companies who have kind of formed up uh, their structures, uh, like Brian mentioned, the the uh, the U.S. tax changes presents a wonderful opportunity to look at whether a U.S. holding company jurisdiction would make sense or not. Uh, People traditionally they would never think of US as a holding company jurisdictions, and generally these are locations like Singapore, Dubai, Mauritius, or Netherlands. But uh, some of, some of the changes in the US tax regime actually uh, puts US as a much uh, uh, ahead uh, than some of the other jurisdictions, which also do not enjoy any tax treaty uh, network. So in that sense, it definitely kind of worth looking at all the changes in the structure. I think this is uh, it for from our side. Uh, in terms of the the, uh, the changes that are taking place recently in either of the economies and we wanted to kind of just uh, provide a flavor of these changes and uh, kind of provide an opportunity to you to kind of assess what it is uh, we are open to questions now so uh, like we mentioned uh, on the chat box window you can put down your questions and we can me and brian can take up the questions uh, one by one Brian, in the meantime, I think there is one question that I had, uh, like like you mentioned, uh, uh, the U.S. Uh, economies, uh, the U.S. government is coming out with guidance on the tax changes, and there's still more some more guidance that is expected in the near future. Uh, what what is the right time to kind of pe for people to start uh, assessing their structures and start looking at these changes? Uh, should they should they immediately do it right now, or should they wait a little bit more for? For, for more guidance from the U.S. Uh, and then relocate the structures. Yeah, that that's a fair question, Malik, and certainly um, something that's gotten our attention uh, on the U.S. side with with the significant in the significance in the ex the expansion of the you know, the expansiveness of these changes. Uh, we really are on a on in many cases awaiting some detailed guidance on what I would call you know, the application from a practitioner point of view, the application of some of these rules at a detailed level. And, and we certainly are anxiously awaiting uh, some of those to unfold here within the next, hopefully, month uh, so that we can make um, uh, both filing decisions, elections, and things like that. That being said, and despite the IRS's promises, and, and despite uh, not knowing on a detailed level some of the uh, aspects of it, uh, we believe now is really a time to 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 start thinking about this. I mean, in in large part, just in despite some things not being known, we really have a, a full context of of what the changes do. We we don't necessarily know how it might impact a particular business, but that's the whole point. Is I think begin to. Uh, work with us and to work through your particular situation so that you can prioritize uh, some of the items coming out of that would would, would be recommended. And, and certainly, e even in absence of the detailed guidance, we think now is the time to begin to, to do that. And I would add to that, certainly in the context of adopting changes to your business model, uh, generally speaking, those things don't occur overnight. And generally speaking, at least from a tax perspective, you, you would not uh, anticipate seeing those occur, for example, even within the same tax year. Those things tend to occur over time. And 
really the the emphasis on the point is that the longer you wait to start thinking about that, the longer it's going to take to migrate into uh, the the revised business model. So we think now more than ever, uh, thinking about tax in the context of business operating models uh, will be sig very significant, and in many cases could very well lead to permanent rate reductions within the supply chain and, and certainly now is a good time to start. Right. So Brian, there's another question uh, which talks about the dream, dream transition tax. It uh -huh. says that given that it applies for 2017, uh, what are you advising your clients uh, whose taxes are due in a few days? <laughs> good, good question. And I can tell you, uh, our firm is not alone, so I don't necessarily mean to represent other practitioners, but uh, on this point, many of us uh, are really puzzled by the detailed application of this. And so, for example, um, uh, the, in order to be in a position to calculate the res any residual U.S. tax effect, if any, you really need some key ingredients. And, and some of those things are unfolding or started unfolding uh, you know, as soon as the, the tax law was released. And it's really taken us across the client base to this point to get in and even make a high level assessment of, of whether they're subjected to this and, and to what uh, would be the estimated range of impact. That's kind of where we're at today. I would tell you, and for those who aren't aware of the significance, to get to the point of figuring out what the residual U.S. tax is, you need to track earnings and profits, really retained earnings, all the way back in some cases to you know 1987 and beyond. And of course, uh, for many taxpayers, that's quite a task because we don't necessarily have complete information. And I think uh, uh, most practitioners would agree uh, with that. The other key ingredient here is to understand not only what your unrepatriated EMP is, but in order to calculate the relative amount of foreign tax credits that may be eligible to offset that inclusion, you really have to go back and recompute and figure out what your, what your foreign tax credit pools are. And the other thing that in addition to those in combination is the idea that you've got earnings within a sub that tracks to uh, ownership structures. And the idea is that this transition tax applies at the U.S. shareholder level, which requires you to go back in time and figure out uh, which years are the relevant years. I would tell you in many cases with our clients, we've got companies that were not uh, what we call control foreign corporations, where despite them having net positive earnings, those earnings in some cases are not relevant. That, that's an important point because to the extent that those earnings aren't relevant, they're then not includable in the return. So uh, very, uh, we would encourage everyone to the extent you haven't begun that, to begin that now. And I think what will unfold is despite, in many cases, the lack of guidance on certain key technical areas, we're assuming that we're not going to be getting any, any additional guidance. I hope that, that that isn't right. But under the assumption that you don't get guidance, you have to make a computation. You have to make decisions from a shareholder level that protect your interest. And in many cases, that especially includes uh, making the appropriate elections. Uh, if you're an escort, making the election to defer uh, at the shareholder level, the impact of that will, will be critical. And unlike uh, other elections where you've got, by the extended due date in this sense, you've got to really focus in on, at least as is currently, the fact that you've got to make these elections by, by the original due date. So a lot more to come. There's certainly, we're looking forward to getting more information in the next 30 days or so on that. Uh, to the extent that we don't, we've got many tax returns uh, that are going out to shareholders today where you've effectively got to make uh, rational business decisions alongside these tax election concepts. Right, Brian, I have one last question. I, I think we have just run out of the time, but I, I, I would want to take this question. Uh, have you seen any uh, companies uh, 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 making U.S. as the holding company in the three months of changes? 
Good, good question. Well, one thing for sure, and, and sort of our, our firm is centered in the middle part of the U.S. The the and by physical location, the Texas market. But we represent clients uh, from coast to coast and from uh, 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 a significant uh, by by count number of different jurisdictions. I would tell you, uh, especially the Texas market, but the Southwest part has been attractive even before these uh, tax changes went in, in, uh, into effect. What we saw was a ramp up in, in interest in U.S. assets by non-U.S. persons. What we think is that these changes, which effectively lowers the U.S. Uh, cash tax rate on earnings derived to U.S. companies, only accelerates those decisions. So for those that were already inclined to be in the U.S. market, it certainly is impactful. And for those that were making decisions where a, a tax was a, at least a, an influencer, if not in some cases, maybe a significant one, uh, these changes uh, is certainly a, a, uh, a net favorable uh, and reduces your overall after tax uh, or, or increases your after tax cash flow from U.S. operations and certainly makes it more appealing, not less appealing for non-U.S. investors. Right. Thanks a lot, Brian. I think uh, uh, we are uh, running over time. So uh, I'd like to thank you and thank all the participants who kind of joined this webinar. Uh, thanks, everyone, for your participation on the webinar. If there are any further questions, our contact details are there. Uh, we'll be more than happy to chat with you for, uh, in terms of any particular situation that you are facing. The slides for this presentation will be emailed to you uh, separately uh, so that you have them for record and you can go through them uh, at, at your leisure. Uh, I, with that, I again, once again, thank you everyone for the participation and we look forward to you joining our uh, uh, webinars uh, in, in future. Uh, we come out with webinars uh, time and again on topical issues, so we hope that uh, we see you in future. Thank you so much. Thank you all.